Today we're discussing how we might better theorize the sociology of religion. For this discussion, I'll be referring to a work by Stephen Chirot that we are reading for this class, but I'll also touch on different ideas from other sociologists of religions and other religious studies scholars as well, and you may recognize those from your other courses too. When we talk about religion, it's often unclear um, what we mean by that term, what it is we're actually trying to signify. At least this is true outside of the critical study of religion. What we want to do in this class is make sure that whenever we use the term religion, that we're very clear what we mean by it. We want to be very specific as to what we're trying to signify. As we proceed in this class and as we look at Chirot's work, we will better understand that when we talk about religion, we're referring to a host of pivotal social changes that changed how humans relate to themselves, to others, and to the world. That is to say, prior to religion, there was a very different understanding of what it meant to talk about self, others, and the world. In some respects, it may not even have made sense to use those terms. But after religion, there are some very interesting things that happen in relation to the self, to the world, and to others. We're also talking about developments that historically can be traced to Eurasia between the 8th and 2nd centuries BCE. That's not to say that religion hasn't happened elsewhere or at different at times following that. But when we discuss religion in this class, according to this schema, we're looking at what scholars have traced um, as emergences, developments that came out of Eurasia between these centuries. There are reverberations that came afterward, for sure, um, such as Christianity, right? That did not happen between the 8th and 2nd century, but it built upon developments that happened chiefly in the 8th through 2nd century. BCE. We also know that religions happened, um, you know, in other parts of the world. Well, we're going to note that um, there's controversy as to whether those things, those elements, are the same as what we refer to um, here as the axial age. And even if you do decide to describe those phenomena as axial developments, you know, say the Maya Empire or conglomerate of states or the Aztec Empire, the other axial civilizations like Christianity for the most part, took care of those empires and religious civilizations such that they're no longer historically attested as continuing to exist today. So the Axial Age civilizations that we see existing today, that is where religion is happening today, are reverberations of things that began in the 8th to 2nd century BCE. And wherever we talk about this thing called religion, we see some phenomena like scriptures. That is, this thing that Western scholars have used to describe how people groups describe and prescribe worldviews. We see the emergence of scriptures, whether it's text or some other sort of resource um, or expression, at play in the axial civilizations that we just discussed. This is what we mean by religion as we proceed in our conversation today. A sociology of religion is interested in two things, at least for our purposes. One, that is the thick description of our data, that is the people who are doing religion. And secondly, it helps us to better define who our data is and what it is that they are doing. So these two interrelated facets um, are what we're looking for when we try to do a sociology of religion or theorize about religion in a sociological way. Sociologists of religion conduct their studies or view people in three spaces. They pay attention in three different areas. The first is religious activity. The second is religious worlds or what we'll call contexts. And you can sort of see the reverberation of context and its relationship to texts or scriptures. Scriptures shape how people see their contexts, right? And lastly, religious orientations. This is also a very important part for our study of religion. This is where we notice religion happening. Those axial shifts happen in those three spaces of religious activity, religious world slash context, and religious orientations. We're going to break down each of these three steps, and sometimes in even smaller areas, but I want you to keep in mind what these three different types of spaces, what they teach us about religion and the people who do it. So when it comes to religious activity, we're very much interested in the change that occurs, right? What change comes about as a result of this thing called religion? 
Sometimes these changes are transformative, okay? They affect the whole world, or they affect societies. People are trying to change the environment around them. Change also happens at a much more local level. It's what we call thaumaturgical change, okay? Thaumaturgy often refers to sort of wonder working or magic. Hence, I drew a little Mickey Mouse from uh, Fantasia, right? And he's got his wand and he does things and it affects the things that are just around him, right? He's able to change um, one thing into another thing. He's able to cool, do cool um, things that are of use to the people around him and to himself, right? So thaumaturgical change is often what we think of as sort of miracle working, right? Healing people, um, bringing about rain when it's, there's a drought. This is thaumaturgy. So th these both are facets of one type of religious activity. There's also another type of religious activity that we're very much interested in, and that's called maintenance, okay? Maintenance is all about keeping intact the namos. Namos is just a fancy way of saying, like, the law, the laws of the universe, right? The physics of the universe, or even the metaphysics, right? How the world works. Um, people do things in order to make sure that those laws are adhered to or kept intact, right? Um, there's also the extrinsic, and extrinsic just means the sort of things that are just, you know, the status quo, always good, without question. People want to maintain the things that are good, without question. They don't want to see any alteration, and that takes work, okay? So that's another type of religious activity that we're very much interested in. Another space that we'll be paying attention to is that of the religious world, or context, okay? In context refer to values, right? The ideas that people hold as what is significant in the world, what is meaningful. And we often learn these values and what's meaningful from our scriptures or a list or some sort of text or resource that tells us this is what is important. We also learn about, um, or we also see organizations take shape, right? People group together in different sort of conglomerates or guilds that help them better understand the world or do certain work that's useful for society. And we also see that the whole notion of a society, right, the socioeconomic and political environments become super important. So it's in the axial age that we start to see cities and empires and, and nations and things that bring people together in, in ways of identifying each other beyond just like we're kin. It becomes something about shared values, shared connections that um, help people understand the world around them. So values, organizations, and socioeconomic slash political environments are all part of the ways we see religious worlds or context. Lastly, we look at religious orientations. And religious orientations build upon the things that we've just discussed, right? We start to see different trends in the people who are doing this thing called religion. One thing we notice is the rationalization or disenchantment of the world. And that's not to say that the sort of... Um, thaumaturgical change that we discussed before goes away. But in fact, during the axial age, we start to see it systematized. We see that the wand gets replaced with thinking and um, thinking out complex ideas and arguments and explanations about how and why the world, where the world works the way it does, you know, according to the namas, right? So the magic wand gets um, replaced by things like theologies and philosophies and things that can be discussed and proved to other people. Right, or at least um, argued so that other people are convinced by them. So you get like this disenchantment feature that comes about with religion. You also still have the transcendence or the super mundane, and that is to say that you have a sense of the world as is, but you place the world within a larger context of not only just the universe, but sort of the way the world works. The world is often sort of at the crux of maybe um, a heavenly sense of the, you know, of the world and, you know, the divine, as well as, um, you know, maybe a place that you send people for judgment, you know, right, the heaven and hell sort of division. That's all sort of a discussion of transcendence or the super mundane versus the profane or everyday world, right? The world that we see is not just all there is. There is more to it. There is something super or beyond it. That's what we mean by the sort of transcendent or super mundane. And that often becomes the goal um, or even a cautionary tale for those who are doing this thing called religion. And lastly, we see universalization, right? So you have this understanding of the world. You want to be able to convince people of it, you know, rationalize your worldview to another. And it's not just the people who are just around you. 
it's also the people who are way far away from you, right? That your ideas are now universalizable. You can take your ideas and trans them, transport them to another society and say, hey, get on board with my worldview. It's going to be better for you. Sometimes people will even say, do it or else. So that th these are all features or facets of the religious orientations that sociologists often look at when they talk about this thing called religion. Now, with these three things that we just discussed in our sociology of religion, that is, activity, worlds, and orientations, we see what's called social stratification, or differentiation among human beings. So one way this happens is between the elites and the popular, and you know that popular refers to the masses, right? What most people do, the sort of everybody um, category of people. This is in contrast to the elites, which can be, be broken down into, one, the virtuosi. And you know what a virtuoso is, right? It's someone who's just wonderful, amazing. We often refer to these people as wonder workers, okay? Elites can also refer to herocrats, okay? Herocrats is sort of what it sounds like, higher ups, okay? And these are the priests. These are officials. Um, they are officers of the universe and how the universe should be according to, you know, the values and scriptures that um, bind this community together. So you have the elites versus the popular, right? We also get a division between the great and the little. And the great would refer to sort of the sacred canopy, big tent, major world, huge complex religions, right? This is often what gets charted out when people talk about religion, right? Christianity. Hinduism, Judaism, right? They're the single isms that we often refer to as examples of this phenomena called religion. But if you do sociology of religion or any sort of critical study of religion for any length of time, you begin to understand that within these big tents, underneath the sacred canopy, are a whole bunch of little traditions, right? Local variety of different isms. So there's this kind of Judaism and that kind of Judaism and this kind of Hinduism and this sort of Hinduism and these people do this and these people do that, but they all fall under the specific big tent or sacred canopy, right? So we see a difference between the great and the little and that results, as a, uh, that results from these kind of axial shifts that we've noticed, noticed. Lastly, we see a differentiation between the official and the unofficial, and the official are sort of the types of activities and practices and procedures that are legitimated or accepted by the herocrats, right? And the social order that they have sought to maintain and that they have worked so hard to change from, um, you know, the sort of barbaric times of the past, right? This is what the axial age was for. It was for creating a society in which people come together to make the world a better place and they who are in charge of that society say, this is what we do, this is how we do it, don't do anything else from this. Those are sort of the official pronouncements that we see happen as a result of the axial age. This is in contrast to the sort of unofficial activities that are done by people, right? Among the masses, there are all sorts of things that people do that aren't really legitimated or even liked by the official group. And so they have to do it sort of underground, on the down low, Hence, you get people saying, shh, don't tell these people that we, don't tell the higher-ups that we do this. These are the types of things that are kept in secret or at least kept under the radar so they don't earn the ire of the officials. And how is this important to the study of discourse like ethnicity and gender? Well, we find that ethnicity and gender are the fault lines upon which many of these stratifications happen. A lot of these social differences happen in regard to ethnicity and gender. So as we go through our case studies, I want you to take careful note of how things like the difference between elites and popular, great and little, official and unofficial, happen along lines of ethnicity and or gender. How is it that religious activity, religious worldviews, context, and orientations take shape differently around ethnicity and gender? In fact, what we'll find is that religion gives meaning to these things that we call ethnicity and gender, at least in a way that was not conceived of prior to the Axial Age. This is what we are thinking of when we talk about theorizing a sociology of religion.